Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin our study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this study this morning, for all the blessings that you have provided through the study of your word and through the fellowship that we have with each other. And we lift one another up in prayer. We ask, Lord, that you can help each of us in the particular struggles that we face each day as we seek to follow and serve you in this world of sin. We see the suffering around us, the needs, and we often feel so helpless. We just ask, Lord, that um, our influence that, uh, that we exercise through our faith in you can can continue to spread, um, that we can be obedient to your word, and that we can be faithful in our study and how we share things with others. Give us wisdom and understanding. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone, again. Um, so we're going to begin by starting over, in a sense. We're going to go back and review um, judges once again. Um, but this time we're going to be a little more detailed in our explanations uh, that we have with understanding these lines. So what we have is we have the book of Judges and obviously it starts in chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? Now, um, I mean, all books start with chapter 1, verse 1. Yet we know that that is a symbol of the first day of the first month. But what does the first day of the first month symbolize? It's kind of a trick question. Well, uh, if we connect it to Millerite history, there's a disappointment. Okay, so there's a disappointment in Millerite history. Um, now, the first day of the first month, when we came to understand the first day of the first month, what did that understanding entail? That's a big question. But... Well, we went through every first day of the first month, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So, so we understood it as a symbol. So it's sort of a symbol of the symbolic use of dates. Would, would that make sense to people? Yeah. Okay. Because I would think in our movement, in that sort of specific way, the first day of the first month is the first place where we begin to look at the symbol symbolic use of dates. Now, of course, the first day of the first month, um, when we look at it, we see if the first day of the first month in the book of Ezra, right? So that, I mean, that's how we began looking at the first day of the first month, Ezra 7, 9. You know, Ezra began to go up, you know, he left Babylon on the first day of the first month and arrives at, arrives at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. Now the first, now it also is a symbol of the beginning right? The beginning of time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1.1. So if, if we're going to look at the law of first mention, I mean, that would be Genesis 1.1. So this symbol of 1.1 1, 1, being the first day of the first month is a symbol of the start of, of time. Now, in our movement, we have uh, what date is symbolized by the first day of the first month? Nine eleven. Yeah, nine eleven, right? And and that became this this uh, primary 
model for our time uh, compared with Millerite history, the first day of the first month, fifth day of the fourth month, first day of the fifth month, 10th day of the seventh month, those four way marks be 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law in our line. Now, um, we have, uh, because of chapter two of Judges, uh, we've come to understand that uh, the book of Judges covers from 9-11 to 2023, because there's 23 verses in chapter two, and it starts out with this symbol, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you up out of Egypt, right? So there's going to be this angel of the Lord coming down. That's 9-11. And um, we went through all the symbolism of that. We're not going to study the verses in detail, but we're going to look at when we draw out these lines, why we've drawn them out the way that we have, why we've chosen the dates. And so we're going to add uh, those details. So when we look at the line of the judges, what we've done is we've taken uh, the arrival of the first message as 9-11. I'll make this a little bigger. So. <clears throat> Oops. Um, so you can see here in this drawing of the judges line, it's going to start at 9-11. And... Um, and then we're, so we're giving the date, September 11th, 2001. Now, since 9-11 is the first day of the first month, and we get that from Millerite history and from the story of Ezra, we've come to understand that from 9-11 to uh, April 5th, 2030, is 354 months. Now, we do this two different ways. One is we take the month in which 9-11 began, so the first day of the sixth month, because that's going to be August 22nd, because 9-11 is on the 21st day of the sixth month. So we're just going to take that month. So from the sixth month to uh, the beginning of the, the Jewish year in 2030 is going to be 354 months. So that's a span of 354 months. And that comes from Ezra chapter 7 to 10, where we have this span of time from the first day of the first month in 457 to the first day of the first month in 456 BC, right? So um, we've, we've looked at that in detail, all of the different dates that are given and the two structural chiasms, the main ones that point to uh, Pentecost in 31 AD, when Christ begins his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary as our mediator, and to the 10th day of the seventh month, which points to October 22, 1844, when Christ uh, begins his work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, beginning the day of atonement, right? So that symbol there, of course, that we have with the Day of Atonement that starts the 2300 days and the 70 weeks is the symbol of 187. So even before we started looking at July 18th as a date, I'd already recognized the 187 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. In fact, it was on August uh, 31st, um, 2013, when Jeff had brought up this study that um, Emiliano had done regarding the first day of the first month and the, and the first day of the fifth month, Ezra 7-9, when he had brought this up and asked some questions about it, because he was looking at uh, a month as having 30 days, so he was looking at uh, 120 days plus 70 days, so he was thinking there was 190 days from the first day of the first month to the day of atonement. And I pointed out to him that that, that wasn't the case, that there was actually uh, 187, 187 days or 186 plus one, but, but it depends how you count it, cardinal or uh, inclusive count. So the 187th day in an ordinal count, that's the 
10th day of the seventh month of the year. So we have that symbol even in uh, 190 for the Gregorian 710. Okay, um, what does that mean, Iran? 190 for the Gregorian. You can get that symbol if you go 190 days on the papal calendar. Oh, so you're saying if you go on, on the Gregorian or the Julian calendar and you count 190 days from January 1st, you come to July 10th? Is that yep. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, because our, our months generally are, you know, 30 or 31, but we have February, which is 28. And so uh, the average uh, month on the Gregorian or Julian is about 30.44 days in length. So less than 30 and a half. But on the biblical calendar, it's just just over 29 and a half days. So anyway, we had this symbol. In, in 2013. And, and I believe that's the first time that I actually counted how many days it was from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month in sort of a, a conscious way, right? I mean, I might have noticed it, but not really thought about it, you know, as having any significance. But there I at least recognized, well, it's 187 days. And um, that to me was... Um, important that it wasn't 190 because I probably in the past would have just you know rounded the months off to 30 days but I knew that the Jewish calendar is based upon the lunar uh, cycle um, from new moon to new moon so so anyway we had that symbol back there right in 2013 so so this becomes an important understanding this, this idea that um, we have of this calendar from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month in 457 BC is 354 days. Right, so it's, um, so we can take these 354 months, we can count them from August 22nd, the actual lunar months, and we will have completed 354 months when we get to the first day of the first month in 2030. Now we could also count 354 prophetic months from 9-11 itself. So when we do that, we arrive at um, October 8th, 2030, which on the biblical calendar is the 10th day of the seventh month. And so that is also important that it gives us um, in a way that's that's unlikely that you're going to just have a span of months that you do it in this way that you're going to have that symbol show up again the tenth day of the seventh month marking 187 days from April 5th 2030. So so this is quite important this this idea um, that we've we've come across as we've looked at Millerite history. This goes all the way back basically to the understanding of how the Millerites arrived at October 22nd, 1844. They did use Ezra 7-9. So they were aware of that. Now, our movement wasn't aware of this until 2013. Um, generally, I would say that we had understood that uh, uh, the first day of the first month or the disappointment when the Jewish year began would have been March 21st, and because that's the date that Miller had given. But of course that would be wrong because if March 21st is the first day of the first month, then September 23rd is the 10th day of the seventh month. And that's not the date that we came to. And, and the very fact that we, we didn't choose March 21st, that we chose April 19th was based upon what? What did the Millerites base the reason that they were going to start the year on April 19th, 1844, instead of March 21st, 1844? Why did they start the Passover? Well, Passover date? No. Well, that was, um, well, Darmstig, he writes about the, I think the last day was the 17th of April was one of their periodicals. 
for the people who are looking to that their day being the last day of the year 1843. So then that would have been the 18th of April. But they, they were using the what they understood to be was the Karyite calendar. Right. So they believe that the Karyite calendar always began one month later than the Jewish calendar. And that's incorrect. In fact, the Karyites would never start the year as late as April 19th. The only time they would start the year earlier, I mean, later than the than the Jews, is if the Jews had begun the year too early. That is, if the Jews had begun the year in, let's say, March 8th or March 9th, then the Karaites, in that situation, they would delay the start of the year by a month. But that would just bring you to the beginning of April. So the Karaites would never start the year as late as April 19th. That would be way too late from their understanding of how the, cal the calendar worked. And as they had a belief that it had to do with uh, the ripening of the harvest. And uh, the reality is if you start the year uh, with the first day of the first month after the spring equinox, you'll always have time for the harvest. It'll always work out. So there's not even a need to look at the condition of of the barley harvest in order to start the, the year. So, so the Millerites came up with the correct date. Of course, they didn't understand how to do that. They did it the wrong way, but they got the right date. And so, yeah, we determined it, it was an accident that they came up with that? Well, it's God's providence, yes. Well, yes, but we we had determined it sort of a, as an accident, but it was accepted. Yeah. Yeah, it was based upon misinformation they had. So some book that they had, that they quote from, says that the Karaites start the year one month later than the rabbinic Jews. But that just was incorrect. That's not the case. So, um, so anyway, we have the first day of the first month in Millerite history. But they base this also upon an understanding of um, Ezra 7-9. That is, originally, when Miller was looking at the going forth of the commandment, he's going to ac actually look at Ezra chapter uh, 7 and 8, and he's going to see them at the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month, leaving the river Ahava. Right, So they're going to then go to Jerusalem, leaving on that date. And he marks that date as the going forth of the commandment. So the 12th day of the first month is this going forth of the commandment. And he's going to have Jesus crucified 490 years later to the day. That is, he believes Jesus was crucified on the 12th day of the first month, or he would believe that at least for a time, um, you know, 490 years after Ezra left Babylon or left the river Ahava. But of course, Jesus was crucified on Passover, not on the 12th day of the first month. And, and he does this from a misreading of a couple of passages. He says there's three verses in the New Testament, but actually there's only two that he uses because the third one doesn't exist. So, um, so there was another error that, that Miller had in how he... Uh, came to the conclusion that Christ was crucified in 33 AD. Of course, he's not even taking into account that there's no zero year between uh, 1 BC and 1 AD. Anyway, when we're looking at these lines here, we can see the importance of the first day of the first month. And we can see this 354 months going to the April 5th, 2030 date. And of course, we would include in that the uh, if we were going to look at that way mark, the Samson and Delilah one, um, we would see that we actually get in the line of Samson and Delilah, we get the October 8th date. It's just not written here on this chart. That is Samson and Delilah, the third angel arrives. Was it the third angel arrives there on October 8th? Um, maybe it's the fourth angel arrives. I can't remember. 
Maybe it's the fourth angel arrives. But anyway, in the line of Samson and Delilah, we end up with the October 8th, 2030 date. But we can see it's a zoom into the April 5th, 2030 date. So what we did is we took these judges and uh, we chose these different dates. Now you can see here, we have this increase of knowledge. Now we mark 2005 and 2014. So what are we marking there in 2005 and 2014? And, and we probably didn't really need to put this in this line because this more comes from Othniel, Ehud, and Shangar. But we, we put them there as part of this increase of knowledge. And what, what are those? So 20,000 or 2005 uh, was, was the rediscovery of the 2520, wasn't it? Okay, but we're specifically marking uh, something there. It, it, it is connected with the rediscovery of the 2520 and the understanding of 9-11, right? So first there's going to be an understanding of 9-11, right? And that's going to be presented where? How is why why did we choose 2005? Maybe that's not the best date. When the uh, the charts. What's that, Stephen? I was saying 2005. You can maybe mark the charts being more significant. Yeah. So the charts become more significant. Now, I kind of think that you know what we could do here is because when we get to Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, uh, we're actually going to mark ozone in 2004. Now, I think that would probably be better. So I'm just going to do this here. I'm going to take this 2005 and I'm going to change it to 2004. Just because once we started looking at these things, um, we're going to take this 10-year period from the ozone Arkansas camp meeting, um, that's where Williams is going to be presenting the understanding of 9-11 and to 2014. And that's going to be um, Arkansas. Um, and, and this can be Arkansas 2014. We actually have two different dates in 2014. We have June 22nd and we have October 22nd. So we have that Pentecost date symbol, and that's going to be when um, Noel presents at that camp meeting. He's going to present um, Ezra 7 9 and count out the days with a really nice uh, detailed chart so that we can understand where the midnight cry occurred, where the first day of the fifth month is, and how it lines up with the midnight cry. So that's going to be August 15th. That's marked there. And then in the October camp meeting, I'm just marking the middle of the week, October 22nd. But it's on the 20th and the 21st that I present uh, chronology. So in this line, you can see that what's being marked here to a large degree is, is the understanding of chronology in this first angel arriving. And the increase of knowledge is regarding chronology. Right, so we have the symbol of the first day of the first month being 9-11. Um, and then we have this first day of the first month study. And then in my studies in, in 2014, right, so, so we're going to have this, um, the understanding of 9-11, and then the understanding of the first day of the first month in 2014, along with an explanation, a more detailed explanation regarding chronology and, and, and that's going to be basically the foundation that's laid as far as the work that I did on chronology by 2014. That's just built upon later on. And then we have the formalization of the message. So here we're going to have October 13th, 2018 to September 7th, 2019. Now, why do we put two dates there rather than just one date?
why do we put that span of time there? It's a period of uh, 329 days, by the way. That's going to be Deborah and Barak. That's going to be the judges there. So we had Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar at 9-11. And then we have Deborah and Barak marked here, October 13th, 2018 to September 7th, 2019. So uh, October the 13th is when you done the calculation of 391 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, September the 7th is when Jeff, in a sense, resurrected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so because that October 13th date, I'm predicting 9-11. Well, I'm not predicting, I'm confirming it, right? I'm taking what, what Tess had done regarding November 9th, 2019. So that's the 11-9 that's there. Well, and then why we formalized it? Yeah, so I'm saying that it, it's formalized in this period of time. So, mm -hmm. so my calculation that I make there is mirrored by, by two events at noon, right? So it's going to be at noon on October 13th, 2018, that I do this calculation of the 391 and a half days, marking the beginning of November 9th, 2019. So 391.5 from noon to midnight, right? And, um, but on September 7th, when Jeff is doing the, the last presentation at Lambert Church, um, I'm also at noon in Warburg Church, watching the video on my phone instead of uh, watching the sermon. And um, and I'm doing the calculation there. So I recognize first that it's going to be uh, 63 days to November 9th. And uh, September 7th, 9 times 7 is 63. So I recognize that. And I also recognize that the middle date between... Um, October 13th and September 7th is March 27th. So the start of March 27th is exactly center between noon, October 13th and noon, September 7th, 2019, right? So, so I notice this date, March 27th, 2019. And that's an important date. Of course, it's the symbol of the Levites, right? And it's going to become a part of these structures that relate to October 13th and um, all these other dates, right? So there's going to be the whole Levitical chiasm that's coming from that. And, and so those, those two dates are part of that Levitical chiasm, right? Because October 13th is at the end of 126 days, right? From June 9th, 2018. And September 7th is at the beginning of 126 days that end with January 11th, 2020, right? So they're very significant, those two dates. Uh, the Levitical Chiasm marks March 27th. And also March 27th, 2019 is interesting because it's the first time I ever talked to Odilio, uh, and that was through Skype. So he contacted me on March 27th. I don't, and I don't think he did it intentionally. It just happened to be that way. And we were discussing, at that time, we were discussing about uh, the July 18th, 2020 prediction. He was trying to encourage me not to give up on it simply because it had been shut down. And I told him I was still studying it, but I wasn't promoting it at that point because I believe that God is leading a movement, not an individual. It didn't make sense for me to be promoting something that, that was different than what the movement was promoting. And I assured him that, you know, if it's truth, God will have his time for it. There's a reason for it. And of course, um, so we're going to find it's at the center of that chiasm. We have that discussion. Jeff is going to wake from his sleep um, 164.5 days later. Um, and then we're going to have this uh, 
revival of the July 18 date. So we can see how this is all a formalization. That span of time is a formalization of this understanding, that this message that arrives at 9-11. So the increase of knowledge is the increase of, of knowledge regarding 9-11. Now, one of the things we see, of course, in this, this judge's line, so if we have the period of darkness, what is the darkness prior to 9-11? And what is this line addressing then? Was it a darkness concerning chronology? Well, okay, that would be part of it. So there's a darkness concerning the chronology of these lines. Um, but when 9-11 happens, is Jeff expecting 9-11? He is not. No, he's not expecting it, right? So he's he's got the first message. 9-11 occurs. And we know, of course, in, in the line that Jeff has, it goes from 1989 to the Sunday line. He's looking for the Sunday law. When 9-11 comes, this is the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. This is the Sunday law, right? He's going to use the verse that Ellen White uses for the Sunday law, Revelation 18, and he's going to place it at 9-11. He doesn't do that right away. It, it's, you know, 2005, you know, maybe that they, they sort of sort that out 2006. They, they, start to get to understand that this is the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. But, but the first thing that we have to see, and that happens at the ozone camp meeting, is, is really the connection to, to Islam and to um, uh, Revelation 9. So that's going to be, I think, the first thing that we see, and that's at the ozone camp meeting. So, so here we have then... Um, uh, this darkness that relates to the understanding of the Sunday law, right? Because that's what Jeff's lines have always been about. And if you think about the line that he has, where he goes from 9-11 to the Sunday law, now he would look at that line as, well, that's all the second angel's message, right? So 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel's message. But in the judge's line, it's the, the arrival of the first message, Right, so the judge's line is a line that's a zoom into um, the second angel arriving. And so, you know, we, we could look at these lines like this. Oops, can't capitalize numbers. There we go. So the judge's line is the second angel arriving on the line above it. So then when we look at Deborah and Barak, of course, as a line itself, which we're going to look at, we know that Deborah and Barak address um, the enemy. And that enemy is Sisera, which represents the message of Parminder. Now, is Parminder's message connected to the darkness that exists before 9-11? I would think yes. Yeah. So what is it about Parminder's message that's related to this darkness that we're talking about? So this darkness has to do with a misapprehension regarding the coming Sunday law. And Parminder's message, what is his message going to be by September 7th, 2019? Time, it's about time, ain't it? Okay, now he's going to miss his time, but when he gets to September 7th, 2019, is he looking for a Sunday law anymore?
Parminder has abandoned the idea of a Sunday law. So 9-11, which we mark as the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down, which really does mark the Sunday law. In that period of time from 9-11, when this first message arrives, we have this counter message. And Parminder's personifying that message as Cicero, right? And this is a message that's contrary to Adventism but is really the expression of where Adventism is going because Adventism is going to support the Sunday law, rejecting the idea that the Sunday law has anything to do with end time events, right? And ironically, they're going to bring it in when, and, and they're going to bring it in thinking it's, it's completely fine. So, so Parminder's message is, is defeated, so to speak, as this enemy when this message of Deborah and Barak is formalized. And this is going to be a message. It's related to time, but all of this is helping us understand the message of the Sunday law, the message that Jeff began with, you know, that we're going to prepare, the, give a message to the Adventist church to prepare them for the Sunday law, because the first and second angels messages have to be accepted in order to pass the test, which is the Sunday law test, which is the third angels message, right? So you can see the simplicity of this, that once we understand uh, how a line works, we can identify events and recognize their significance because they relate to a message that is a response to darkness. So the story of Gideon is the empowerment of that. That's going to, of course, be the close of probation for Parminder's movement. Now, that's going to be 11-9. That's November 9th. And, and we're going to look at that line of Gideon, of course, again in detail. Can we see that this line is very logical and consistent? It certainly looks that way. And can we see that this is actually the logical uh, conclusion that we would draw from all of the light that has come to this message right from the beginning of Jeff's message? Now, when we deal with an empowerment, what specifically is an empowerment about? I mean, in Millerite history, it's going to be, you know, the end of the second woe, August 11th, 1840. So why do we mark 11.9 as the empowerment? And why the story of Gideon? Because we know the story of Gideon is going to be primarily about uh, the Sunday law. Uh, but it's also really going to lead us to July 18, 2020, because that's where the 300 are located. So what is it about 11.9 that is the empowerment of this first message? And we're going to see in more detail how Gideon uh, illustrates that. Because what, what is the story of Gideon, uh, Gideon illustrating? Our need to take God at his word. Yeah, and, and the proper way to study God's word, 
right? Not the Protestant system of Bible study. Right, correct. Okay. And, and in order to do that, to trust God, this is going to be a whittling down, right, of this, all these people that come to fight this battle against the uh, Midian, right? And um, so how does that parallel August 11th, 1840? How does that parallel as an empowerment to the first message? Because in Millerite history, what, what is the message of Miller and how is that empowered by August 11th, 1840? Well, August 11th, 1840 was the realization that there is prophetic word that has been given and that we can trust in that prophetic word. So the year day principle. Correct. So that is that a prophetic year is 360 days. So that's confirmed by August 11th, 1840. So, so an empowerment is a confirmation of something. Now, on November 9th, 2019, um, what is the confirmation? What is, what is it that empowers this message related to time that, that addresses the darkness? So it's not just that it's about time, about chronology. It's about... Um, the symbols of chronology and how they relate to the Sunday law. So what is it about what happens on November 9th that would be marked as an empowerment? Hey, Stephen, do you, you know, because you were there. I mean, what what was your perspective of of that Sabbath? What was being presented? I mean, I know what my perspective was because I was presenting. But okay, I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay, so you were doing the, the presentation on the, uh, was it not, um, Thanksgiving? No, that was the next day. So on the Sabbath, I presented the Mayan calendar in the 273. Right, okay. That's a bit of a, a while ago. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, it, it's really significant to me, right? You probably remember more about the Thanksgiving study that we did on Sunday. But on November 9th, I, I presented two presentations on the number 273. Um, now, this was related, of course, uh, to the Mayan calendar. Now, does is 273 related to 300, to the symbol in Gideon? Didn't we determine that it was through a um, spirit of prophecy? Okay, so we have Ellen White, Acts 27. She talks about the number of people on the boat, which is 276, from where we get the three Christians and the 273 non-Christians, right? That we get the symbol of 273 there. and that, But Ellen White says it's 300. And so in Gideon, we have this 300. But we also know in Numbers chapter 3, where we get the number for the Levites by subtracting uh, the number of the Levites, which is actually 22,300, but they leave out the 300 and they subtract that from the firstborn of all the children of Israel as 22,273. 
to get this 273 where we have to pay uh, whatever it is, five shekels or something per person um, uh, to get this uh, redemption of the firstborn, right? So, so we can see that the 300 is related in both of these verses. So 273 um, is this, this, this number of the, of the Levites, but it's related to the number 300, which is in the story of Gideon. So Gideon's 300 is also a symbol for the Levites. Can we see that? Now, one of the things about that number that's in Numbers 3, where they take 22,300, and they, they don't tell you why they don't count the 300. There's lots of assumptions. Um, but we know the number 300 relates to the charts, both to the 1843 and the 1850 chart. There was 300 made of each of these charts. Um, and so that symbol is there dealing with the charts themselves. So we have this in the story of Gideon on November 9th. We have the 273 symbol. We have the 300 symbol in the story of Gideon. So, so the empowerment then is... Um, this this introduction here, here of 273 in connection with the mind calendar. That is, I'm talking about um, July 18, 2020. Specifically, I do two different types of calculations using um, <clears throat> uh, the, the period of 391 and a half years. And I use it with the mind calendar to try to create this prediction as well. So I tried different ways in which to reach July 18th. And um, I have a period of um, 273 times two, which is, um, that would be what, 546 or something like that. If I did the math right. And the center date of that is the 10th day of the seventh month. So it falls with this chiasm of these two dates. It falls short of July 18th by 10 days. Uh, but the 10th day of the seventh month is an important symbol, right? So we can see that it, it, it ties these together. And we're, we're going to look at that in more detail as well when we look at Gideon. So, <clears throat> so Gideon is the empowerment of this message, that first message. Now we have a second message that arrives at July 18th, which we're going to say is Tola and Jair. Now, of course, after Gideon, we have Jotham, right? So he's going to be one of Gideon's sons, what we would call the 70th son, the 70th week, right? And he's going to have this prophecy, prophecy which is a parable. And, and we're going to say that Jotham parallels of the message of Samuel Snow, specifically Samuel Snow's letters. So we're going to, when we look at that, we'll deal with all the dates in that. But we have Tola and Jair are the arrival of the second angel. So why are Tola and Jair the arrival of the second angel? And why do we mark them at July 18th? Okay, first it was because there was two of them. I, I kind of seem to remember that. That was, yeah. so that was so discussed. A yeah, there's a doubling. Right. And there, there was all these symbols. There was the 22 year, the 23 years and the 22 years. Right, right. It was going to relate to the 45. Right. And there's, there's lots of symbols in there um, that I don't think we really explored in detail. But, I mean, we know the 45, that relates to 1945, um, 
to Hiroshima, which of course occurs on the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar, uh, which is the date we have for July 18, 2020. It's the 26th day of the fourth month. So that 264 is going to come into play with that. Now, Tola and Jair are only five verses. They start at 10 verse 1, and they go to 10 verse 5. So they go to a symbol that is the 10th day of the fifth month. Um, if we want to take it that way, that's one way to take the symbol. Okay. Now, Angela says that Habakkuk 3 verse 17 to 19 has to do with um, Jotham's uh, prophecy. So that would be... Three. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Um, well, there probably is some connection. I don't know what, what would be the exact connection between those verses. So anyway, we have Tola and Jair. We're marking them as the arrival of the second angel. And there's the symbols that occur in those passages. Um, we're also going to have the 30 sons, the 30 ass cults, and the 30 cities. Right? And we know that 30, 30, 30 gives us that 525, 252 separation. And so marking July 18th, which is 252 days after uh, November 9th. And, um, and then the 525 days that goes from that date to December 25th, 2021, which is going to be the empowerment of that second angel. That makes sense, right? So, so that was the other reason we, we placed it at July 18th was that 30, 30, 30 number. So that's 303,030 divided by 12 for each of the 12 tribes. Gives us what? 2525.5. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, so we have Jotham, Jotham there as being the parallel to Samuel Snow. Now, Jotham, of course, is the 70th week, and the 70th week gives us the first day of the first month. So remember that um, Samuel Snow, his, his line is symbolic. His line is typical, his line of his letters. And he gives us July 18th because that's the last letter that's published prior to midnight. So that, um, so that connection between Jotham and Tola and Jair is, is, is clear that it, it's helping us establish this July 18, 2020 day as this fourth way mark. And, and we know that if this is the second angel arriving, that's April 19th, 1844, and Samuel Snow's letters mark these two Passovers on either side, plus the July 18th date. And, and so the story of Jotham fits well in that it, it gives us July 18th, but it gives us both sides of it. That makes sense. So that's why it spans uh, this period of time. It's, it's, and he's not really a judge, right? Jotham isn't a judge. So, so he can't be included in one of the, the, the seven judges. <clears throat> um, and then we're going to have uh, December 6, 2020. That's going to be the formalization of this message of July 18th. And that's going to be the story of Jephthah. So why did we choose December 6, 2020 as the formalization of the second message?
I'm sorry. Could you ask that question again? So we have December 6, 2020, and we're saying that this is the formalization of the message that uh, arrived on July 18, 2020. Now, so one of the things that, what, what really arrives on July 18, 2020 as a message? So in order to understand the formalization, what message arrives on July 18, 2020? <sighs> you can't make predictions. <laughs> but, but it's... We it's need in, in a situation like this, really, that we need to give glory to God for the prophecies that he's already provided. Yeah. Okay. And when we get to July 18, 2020, that evening, you know, before July 18, 2020 proper, but based on the 26th day of the fourth month, I do a presentation on the Mayan calendar showing that it's in a line of failed predictions. Now, it's not the first time I mentioned it, but I, I'm pretty sure that whatever happens on July 18, 2020, that it has to relate to that line of failed predictions. That's going to be the, the, the 777 chiasm. That is, it's going to include four different periods of 777 days. Um, with 183 days in the center, right? So it's going to start on that Mayan calendar date. It's going to include my 52nd birthday, right? It's going to include uh, September 7th, uh, 2000, or September 23rd, pardon me, 2017, when I first used July 18, 2020 as a symbol. And so I'm showing that uh, on July 18th, that the reason for the our predictions failure, even before it really has failed, um, is that it's in a line of failed predictions and that there's a purpose in that and that we need to understand that purpose. So it's clear by the next morning, July 19th, I have the explanation for our, our disappointment. But that explanation is largely ignored it's going to be rejected. Now we're going to see that in the story of Jephthah with the December 6, 2020 date. So, so that's the formalization of the message. That's going to be the day in which they publish this declaration rejecting July 18, 2020. But why is that a formalization of the message? Well, In a way of looking at this, with what we went through on July 18th and December December 6th of 2020, mm -hmm. isn't this very much the antithesis of what happened with the Millerites, with Hiram Edson's Hornfield vision? Yes. Well, well, I don't know. I don't know if antithesis is is quite the word that I would use. Well. I'm looking I think, at it. I think it's more a parallel. Well, okay. For sixth, they rejected everything that had been said, everything that had been presented about July 18th, right? Yeah. Where with Edson's cornfield vision, it was not rejected outright he was still recognized as being one of the supporting pioneers, even right up to the situation that began to occur in 1860, because he had these, those unfinished articles that he had on the Times of the Gentiles. Yeah. Well, well the other thing, though, is they didn't know about the Cornfield vision, vision until 1905. Well... Did they not know about it, or did they just choose not to publish it? Well, I would think only a few people knew about it. It, it definitely was never mentioned in any literature until 1905. Right. right. So, so there's no mention in the spirit of prophecy. 
of his cornfield vision. Right? I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. So in 1905, we hear about it. But we'll here again. Yeah. But Hiram Medicine was so highly regarded by the whites that they yeah. need one of it, one of their sons after him. Yeah, and they would have known about it. Okay. The mm -hmm. other part is with this cornfield vision not being published until 1905, how heavy with symbolism is that for us in this situation since the visions on Nashville were published by Mrs. White in 1905? Right. So I think, you know, part of it to me is... Because there was this argument made by Larry Lesher at the time. Well, you know, where's higher medicine's cornfield vision? You know, and I said, well, I've already presented it. What I presented on uh, July 19th is the equivalent. Right. It gives the reason for our disappointment. Just exactly. That. And and yet that was rejected. Like it just was not accepted by those who published the declaration. And, and part of that is it was attached to me as a person, right? They, they didn't want what I had presented. And I'd actually presented that prior to July 18th as part of the Nashville um, uh, website. And, and they did post it. It was posted for a day or so, um, the line of failed predictions. And then they took it down without any explanation. And when I asked them about it, I got no reply. So, and this is prior to July 18th. So you can already see that there is this uh, prejudice against um, July 18 and anything that's going to idea of what July 18 is about. But it's clear to me that July 18, if it was going to happen, um, it wasn't going to be pleasant for us, right? Because I saw it as a disappointment and it had to be a disappointment. Now that it came out in the way it did make sense, you know, in retrospect, but it made sense also prior to um, July 18th, because I was really struggling with the fact that we had a movement that was really unprepared. So, so when we get to Jephthah, now, the story of Jephthah is um, uh, interesting in, in a lot of different ways because one is it's, you know, Judges chapter 11, and you're going to have 11-1, which is January 11th. Um, and you're also going to have some uh, uh, um, important symbols in Judges 11-11. So, so there's a lot of sim symbolism in the story of Jephthah that relates to our message. Um, not just in the verses, but in the story itself. And then we have Jephthah's tragic vow, right? Which is going to relate to, when, when we look at this whole thing, it's going to relate to July 18, 2020. But, but this story of Jephthah is going to span... Um, I mean, all of them, in a sense, are connected to. Let me see if we can find this here quickly. These are all mixed up, different order. I know we have Jeff's line somewhere here. Jotham's line. There's Jephthah, right? So it's going to go back to this June 22nd date. That's going to be uh, a symbol of FFA, right? And it's also going to have the June 22nd, 22 date or 2020 date um, when we publish the proclamation or not the proclamation. We publish the, um, the prediction in the Tennessee and, and it becomes international news on the 22nd of June. So now this is going to be embar embarrassment to FFA. So July 18th is an embarrassment to them. 
And so they reject it on December 6th. So when we look at this line in detail, um, we will see how that, how that fits. But it's also going to give us um, this April 5th, 2030 date. I don't know why I didn't finish that off properly, but... Anybody know what the 5766 days is? What that comes from? I'm not recalling quickly. Yeah, so yeah my notes don't show anything. You said, what was that number again? 5766? Yeah, we had this 5766, and I don't remember what it is. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't see anything in my notes. Uh, I don't remember what it is. Um, it might have been the gematria or something. I don't remember. So that's why we need to have all these things written out. Right. So it shows up there somehow, but you know, you can see it's going to bring us that April 5th, 2030 date. So I don't know if it's, if it, where I got that from, whether I just counted the number of days and divided it, that might be just what I did. Um, okay. But anyway, when we get to Jephtha and we start drawing these out, we're going to have to make sure that we get all of these, these symbols, uh, written out so we know what they are, so we can explain them. Okay. So then we're going to have Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. They're going to relate to a December 25th. So one of the things we're going to see with these, these last ones is they're going to give us, us all the 777 days. So both the empowerment and... Uh, um, uh, in the story of Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, and also in the story of Samson. We're going to get these 777-day structures. They're all going to start on November 9th and end on December 25th, 2021. And, and that makes sense. But then when we get to Samson and Delilah, it's going to start at the end of the 777 days. So with Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, we had these judges that were giving us this really short. Um, <clears throat> now, we also have you know, a whole bunch of things in the story of Jephthah because there's going to be this issue with Ephraim. Um, so 16 prophetic years. Um, So what are you saying about that number there, Angela? Five thousand six hundred and seventy-six. Five thousand seven hundred. You were asking. You were asking where the five seven six six came from. So from two thousand fourteen to two thousand thirty, it's sixteen years. So I figured, well, let's multiply three sixty by sixteen and see what happens. And that's what I got. Okay. Yeah. So it's sixteen years. Um, and six days. So I don't know what that means, but yeah, it's 16 years. Um, prophetic years, 16 years and six days, which is a symbol of FFA, isn't it? One six six is a symbol of FFA. The six yeah, I think that was yes. it. But in um, yeah, <clears throat> that's interesting. Okay, and um, 
So with these three judges, we have um, uh, we have these symbols of seven years, ten years, and eight years, right? Which gives us July eighteen as a symbol, and of course, that's at the end of the seven 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 structure. We're going to have the 40 sons and 30 nephews. So we're going to have the 70 uh, assholes. And we also have the 30, 30, 30 um, in this line, just as we do with Tola and Jair. Right? So Tole and Jair give us that period from November 9th to uh, July 18th, the 252, plus all the span to December 25th. So Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, Ibzan specifically gives us the 30, 30, 30, and that's going to give us that same count. So we can see that's at the end of the 777 days. And that makes sense, Right. So you can see these symbols sort of fit into these lines uh, naturally. There isn't some artificial way in which we gave these dates. Now, the story of Samson is, is going to be a zoom into the third angel arriving. And we're saying the third angel is arriving with this symbol of January 11th. That's the end of Colin's prediction of the prophetic mirror that he creates, where he refuses to count the actual days. He refuses to complete the mirror. Instead, he wants to look at it as the, the, the 19 and the 46, referring to, uh, to Trump and to Biden, instead of counting the days, which to me seems illogical to do that. Um, I have no problem with the 19 and the 46, because I think they do apply at that time. So, but the, the point that here is that uh, Samson, the story of Samson, is a zoom into that date. And it's again going to confirm the April 5th, 2030 date. Um, because that whole structure is, is all fitting together. This, this is an important part of the study when we present this at the camp meeting, is that people can clearly see the significance of Colin's study and of Adilio's study and, um, and how this relates to the story of the judges, how judges is going through our history. But it's going to also give us our future. Now, the future, of course, isn't as clear exactly what it means, but we can see that everything that these lines have shown us is that this is a reform line and that we're being reformed from aspects of our character uh, that are being manifest as we respond to light. So if we're rejecting light, certain aspects of our character are going to be demonstrated. And um, we've seen these over and over again in the different studies that we've done. The problem in this movement Envy, jealousy, gossiping, backbiting, um, misrepresentation, uh, seeking a position, um, just generally not aware of our own spiritual condition, of how far we are from God, and, and of course, um, an interest in a message that is emotional rather than one that is um, sober, right? Well thought out message, looking for God's guidance and also look, looking for unity that we, instead of pulling in different directions, seeking to find what God has for us and, and, in working together to recognizing that God's giving light to different people, not just to a single person. <clears throat> so, 
So this is how we've laid out the line. I mean, I personally don't see how we could put any different dates here um, than we have based upon the symbols of these uh, judges. Now, we all should be able to draw out this line. It's not hard, you know, especially when you have a, a narrative um, like we have with this line. Now, sometimes, you know, I have a hard time remembering the names of the judges, but, you know, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, we know these go together as the arrival of the first message. Deborah and Brack, those are easy to remember in the story of Sisera. Gideon, we'll never forget. Tola and Jair, because we hardly ever deal with them, those would be hard maybe to remember for some people. Um, but we should know that those are the judges that come after Gideon. But that Jotham is in there, right? So he's in that history. Now, now, Stephen, when it comes to some of the chronological aspects of um, the judges, we still have questions, right? Do you, do you know what questions you still have unanswered when it comes to the chronology things that you're struggling with? Um, sorry, say it again. What questions of chronology do you are you still struggling with in in the period of the judges that you're uncertain about? Because, because we know it's very, it was very few, hard to pin down, really, um, to reconcile some of the the years. Um, pretty much most of it. Okay, so you got pretty much most of it, and we would know. No, well, most of it's hard to reconcile. So most of it's hard to reconcile. Yes. Okay. But but as far as you know, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, we have the spans. We know when they end. We know when Deborah and Barak begin and end, right? And but we do know that there are some overlaps um, uh, when we get to the time as of the Philistines, right? So those are going to be. Um, that's going to be more when we get to Samson and and Eli and, and that, that we're going to have problems, right? There is issues there, yes. Okay. Um, but we know, you know, we have Gideon. We know how long he reigns. We know that Abimelech, even though he's not technically a judge, at least his period of time is marked. I mean, probably he's the king to some degree. And Tola and Jair... Those are given to us. Um, we know how long they reigned, and and they f they follow one. And you know, Jair follows Tola. Tola follows Abimelech, right? And now with Jephthah. Um, now sometimes I think where some of the problems might arise has to do with the periods of oppression exactly when they start is is that a problem marking the periods of oppression in connection with the judges or do those seem pretty clear yeah there's uh, difficulties there as well okay Okay, so these are things, um, and I, I think that we do want to address in some of these studies. We want to go over your chronology again. Um, I don't know when we should do it or how we should do that. Uh, I should be ready to post it again, hopefully within the week. Okay, and then we can go through that chronology and just kind of um, see if we if it's if we can agree with it, I'll kind of agree on it. 
Okay. So anyway, we're going to have Tola and Jay Ear, um, and that seems pretty clear cut. But you know, like after Tola and Jay Ear, uh, you're going to have the Philistines, right? Um, and and um, you know, those are going to sort of be overlap. So there's these periods of time that I'm not certain about. Now, the story of Jeff is going to re directly relate to our time. And uh, and then the other thing I, I want to really address is these the, the role of Ephraim in all of this, because Ephraim keeps showing up. But we know that um, Samson's going to come at the time of the, the Philistine oppression, very specifically. Now, the Philistines, of course, are in... Um, the West, right, along the coast. And Samson's going to be in that area. I mean, we know Samson travels to, to Hebron with the, uh, the gates of the city. But, um, you know, he's mostly over in, in, and Hebron's, you know, sort of more central um, in Israel to some degree, you know, south of Jerusalem. Um. But, you know, what we're going to have is we're going to have these this period of times of the Philistines. And it seems, according to Stephen's chronology, that there's an overlap uh, with, like, the story of Eli. That it's going to be in this same time of Samson. Right? Because we're going to have the Philistines there with the Ark being captured, etc. And, and that's not something that most people... Uh, address and and that would be a problem too when you look at how people just sort of put it afterwards wouldn't make any sense in the context of the Philistines. Samson would have to be in that same history as Eli and Samuel, right? So then, um, uh, so Samson is complicated because it has uh, three chapters that we can treat as separate lines, that we can treat all as one line, and then you have the story of Samson and Delilah. So, um, any thoughts about these this line of the judges? I mean, we could we should be able to see the whole picture now. Because we, we know all of the different stories. Um, these dates seem to fit as far as the line of the judges. I don't see problems with them, but maybe somebody has different suggestions. But, you know, we kind of hammered our ways through it. Um, you know, worked out the details. And, and we definitely need that April 5th, 2030 as the Samson and Delilah date, even though when we zoom in, there's a lot of other dates in there. But, <clears throat> um, and this makes sense how we're taking this line of the judges. Now, one of the problems we have still with the line of the judges is in the line above it, which is the line that we have as our cosmic line, we actually don't have judges as a waymark. The judges is, occurs in a period of what we would call a progressive destruction of four. Now, the way that I look at the judges is it's a failed reform line. So even though it's a reform line and it refers to our history, in the actual cosmic line itself, the story of the judges is um, would be a part of this progressive destruction of four. Right. So we would go back to this um, lampstand. So if we look at this lampstand here, Right. We don't see the judges here. Um, but we have a cosmic line so that is literal Israel. And in the line of literal Israel, 
again, we don't have the judges, right? So um, let me see here. I don't know where I put that line. Okay, here's the line of literal Israel. So there's our cosmic line. There's literal Israel. Well, literal Israel isn't um, one of the lines. So it's going to happen after Egypt to Canaan. So when they get into the promised land, you're going to have a progressive destruction of four that leads to the story of Saul's anointing, right? right? Which is going to be a reform line. So here, the period of the judges is this, you know, It's, it's not part of this literal Israel line in the sense of being a way mark. And so you would take the Egypt to Canaan line. However, that, that line is understood. And after they get into the land of Canaan, you know, so after they cross the Jordan River, um, you're going to have this accomplishment. This is going to be a reform line. But then you're going to have this period of the judges, which is, it's a period of a falling away, right? And, and really this is going to be the reform line of the judges is that history. So we still haven't figured out how to fit this into these other structures. We just don't have a waymark called the judges in anywhere, right? And does that seem reasonable that we can take the story of the judges and create a line, but it's not a major way mark in any of these other lines. It's only a progress, a part of a progressive destruction of four. So can we have a de progressive destruction of four and have a reform line within it? Um, the way I, the way I was looking at this the whole time has been not necessarily as a progressive destruction of four, but, um, we're just keep to the same principle of, uh, the seven way marks and trying to figure out which one eat or represents which one, um, but the idea of it being a failed reform line it, I mean, it makes sense because all, pretty much it's a bunch of failures all the way through it. Um, when we when we measure it up to uh, our movement. Well, yeah, and yeah. Now, the idea of a fail of a failed reform line is just that when you have a major reform line, you're going to have the first generation, and then in the first generation, you're going to have a failed reform line. Right. And then you're going to have the second, third and fourth generation. And then you're going to have the fourth is a period of darkness. And then you have another reform line, the time of the end and another. Uh, understandable. Period. Right. And so we can see, you know, even the story of Nehemiah is a failed reform line. Right. It's after the three decrees. They get back to Jerusalem and, and we can say, well, it's a reform line. I mean, it, it's good. But when I say it's a failed reform line, that is what ends up happening with this story of Ezra and Nehemiah, as we have established two things. One is in the story of Ezra, they build the temple of Jerusalem, right? During that whole time, you know, from when they, uh, you know, come out of Babylonian captivity under those three decrees, it's completed. They build this, this temple and they establish this city. And, and, and they make this separation from the strange wives, right? And then in the story of Nehemiah, they they become more strict in their Sabbath keeping. They reestablish. baby. So those are good things. But when you look at the history of Israel from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah to the time of Christ, the two main things that they have problems with are their exclusiveness and their Sabbath keeping, the, all of their rules, but particularly the Sabbath that has just become legalistic. 
So they, they haven't accomplished what they were to accomplish. And so, so a failed reform line doesn't mean the reform line itself is a failure, but it just means that ultimately the results of that reform line end up being the issue that's going to be addressed in the next major reform line. And, and the, we'll see that in the story of the judges and how it relates to the kingship coming into play. Because part of the thing about the judges is there's no king in Israel and every man does what is right in his own eyes. So they've rejected God as their king. And so they end up with a literal king. And even in the story you know, of Abimelech, who, who becomes a king, he's really the first king, uh, though not, you know, um, ordained by God, right? So that makes sense, right? So you can see how the period of the judges is not a zoom into a, a way mark on a major line above them, right? We don't have a way mark that's, that the judges mark in any reform line other than after a reform line that, that, that we have the period of the judges that leads us to the period of darkness, right? So by the time we get to the end of the judges, we're in a period of darkness in need of an actual major reform line. But it doesn't mean that you don't have reform lines in, um, in, in those histories between major reform lines. You do. They're just illustrating. Well, that's what we've been proven out. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, thanks for the study, everyone. We'll come back to this tomorrow. And uh, let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. And um, help us as we continue to proceed in sorting through these lines uh, once again to have them uh, set out in some kind of a clear structure, a simple presentation, so that we can present these to others. Please best bless each person today. May your angels watch over them. May you help them in their day-to-day -day decisions. Through your spirit speaking to them, help each of us to hear your voice, that we may reflect your character. We pray for those that are suffering, and um, we solicit uh, each other's prayers, Lord. We ask that we can pray for one another and that we can encourage one another. We pray for this movement and those in it, and we just ask that you can lead and guide as we uh, seek to encourage each person. Be with us throughout this day, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.